Okay, so uh, we've done the intro to ancient Greece and we've talked a little bit about some of the really early periods. Now we're going to talk about the archaic period, which can actually further be broken down beyond just the archaic, so I'm going to go into that a little bit more. Um, okay, so on. there we go. First, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Daedalic art, okay? So if you remember from the prehistoric Aegean, we talked about a guy named Daedalus, okay? So he um, was, he's in a lot of the mythology, but he was probably a real guy, and he was this kind of uh, inventor and sculptor and architect and master builder um, who, according to legend, um, was in the employ of King Minos on Crete, and he's the guy who designed the labyrinth that, that held the Minotaur, which we now know, after talking about that in our prehistoric Aegean, we know that that wasn't a real thing, right? Obviously, okay. But he, he was maybe a real guy, and um, so he uh, had some influence, whether he was real or mythic, he, his, um, he or the concept of him had influence in the Archaic period in ancient Greece. Um, so basically, uh, there's a Greek trading colony in Necrotus in Egypt, um, which brought Greeks kind of uh, into contact with these massive stone buildings and all the amazing things that the Egyptians were doing, which we looked at, remember, in our ancient Egypt and Kush uh, unit. So um, because of this trade, there's a lot of influences um, from Egypt coming into the Greek uh, kind of visual vernacular, the Greek uh, concept of what uh, visual art should look like, what architecture should look like, the scale of things, what, what things should be made out of, all of this is very influential. Um, so Greeks start building in stone, um, which is the first time this has happened since the fall of Mycenae, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, so there's a couple of different temples that they build. There's one just called Temple A, which is one of the earliest Greek temples. Um, and, and then we start seeing more work in stone. So for example, this sculpture is known as the Azure Lady. Um, she, should, she could be a goddess, she could be a maiden, we're not sure. A lot of these um, statues of young people are called Koros or Kore, which uh, means youth, koros being male, kore being female, uh, and then the plural uh, for kore, which is female, is korai, uh, K-O-R-A-I. Um, and so all women and goddesses from this time period are depicted as clothed, as wearing clothing, while male figures are almost always nude, which is kind of an interesting thing. Like, it was okay for men to be portrayed nude, but it was not culturally acceptable for women to be portrayed nude. This particular one was found um, at Eleutheria uh, on Crete. We see it's a little bit more naturalistic than the way humans are depicted in the geometric period. Remember our Heracles and Nisos, for example. So, so a little more naturalistic then, but also not super naturalistic, pretty stiff, right? Um, this is probably a depiction of a uh, woman who, who has died um, being depicted in prayer. She has this skirt that, if you look closely, is decorated with this um, incised, kind of carved in geometric pattern that are concentric uh, squares, so squares inside of each other. Um, this originally would have been very brightly painted. Uh, the, le the flesh, the, the, her skin would have been left in the same tone as the stone, but her clothing and, and her makeup and everything would have been brightly painted. Um, likely it would have been um, also coated with wax, so some encaustic painting where the pigment is in a, a wax carrier so it can be polished along with the stone. Um, okay, so this is pretty typical of the Daedalic style. So we have these more triangular kind of head shapes. Um, we have this kind of flatness of face. We still, we have a lot of geometric kind of influence. So we have these ge this geometric kind of patterning. This is all very typical of this period, which is kind of the early archaic or the Daedalic art period. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the archaic period and look at some more of this influence of um, Egyptian art into ancient Greek art. So Daedalus was a sculptor and an architect. He actually designed uh, the temple at Memphis, it is thought, uh, not Memphis in the United States, but Memphis in Egypt. 
This led to this heavy influence of Egypt and early Greek art. So if we look at this Koros, which again, a Koros is just a statue of a young man. This one is called the New York Koros um, because it's in the Met now. And uh, so look at these two in comparison to each other. We have this kind of emulation of Egyptian statuary. You can tell in the pose, the way the arms are very stiff into the side with the hands and fists, the way we have one foot slightly in front of the other, which remember from our ancient Egyptian section, the reason they did that was taking one step forward into the afterlife. So the meaning doesn't really carry over into the Greek statues necessarily, but the pose is pretty directly copied. Um, Okay, so uh, this statue, these kind of statues in Greece had um, a funerary function. They were used uh, in cemeteries a lot. So this particular one stood over a grave in Attica, which is very near Athens. And these statues start kind of replacing craters. Remember last time we talked about um, craters? Those are the big ceramic vases with the big open openings, the wide openings which were made like three feet tall and, and stood at grave sites as kind of grave markers. These in the archaic period are replaced by these uh, statues of young men and young women and used as grave markers. The cori are also used as kind of offerings uh, in sanctuaries to the gods. Um, they differ from the Egyptian statues in two main ways. One thing is they're liberated from the stone block. Greeks are more interested in depicting motion rather than stability. So in these Egyptian statues, a lot of times we have this solid uh, pilaster or, or rock beam at the back to make sure the statue is very solid. Sometimes they were actually um, attached to walls. You'll also notice the space between the arms and the torso is solid, is filled in to create this uh, more stability, also the area between the legs, whereas on the Greek sculpture, that's all carved out, right? So much more of an interest in um, motion and a little more interest in naturalism, even this early in the archaic period, than the interest in stability and rigidity that we see from the Egyptians. The second thing is that Korai are always nude. The, the male statues are always nude in, in the archaic Greek statuary, um, and we have an absence of identifying attributes. So in the Egyptian sculptures, um, we know that this is, for example, Mentuhet from uh, Karnak, Egypt, um, not only because of the time period in which it's been dated and created and the context in which it was found, which is in his tomb, but also his name is on it. His name is on the belt, his name is in on the plinth that it's attached to. We have some really specific identifying information here. His headdress is that of someone at his uh, state, so, so a pharaoh, whereas the ancient Greek statues mimic the pose and everything, but they're, um, they kind of are, are stand in for, for anyone, for any young man, basically, unless they are clearly labeled, which this one isn't. We do see a lot of similarities physically, though. We have the slim waist, we have everything kind of based in triangles, this kind of triangular torso, long hair, this kind of V shape uh, at the hips. The left foot is forward, okay? So this is all pretty standard in the archaic period and it's lifted directly from the ancient Egyptians. Okay, let's look at a slightly different example. So this is a calf bearer, which in Greek is Mastophoros, um, and it, is, it has a dedication on it, so we actually know who uh, created this. So the person who either commissioned it or carved it was named Ronbos, and we know that because it's engraved. Uh, so Ronbos, son of Palos, dedicated this to Athena, and that's what the inscription on it says. So it was made as an offering to the goddess Athena. Why would this be presented as a statue? Well, the statue is bringing her a calf, and instead of sacrificing one calf um, to the temple of, of your goddess of choice, in this case Athena, why not make a statue of someone perpetually bringing a calf to sacrifice. So it's kind of a stand-in for, I would always, uh, this will eternally be bringing you sacrifices, Athena. So the idea was this was kind of a, a good kind of devotional act. Um, Rombos is probably the name of the calf bearer. He probably portrayed himself or had a sculptor, he commissioned a sculpture to portray himself as the one continually bringing the sacrifice to her, bringing this offering to the goddess. Um, there's a really big difference here between any of our uh, Egyptian statuary. He is smiling. He has this weird, I think kind of creepy little smile 
This is one of the hallmarks of the archaic period. For some reason, the ancient Greeks decide that these statues should always be smiling. So we have these kind of subtle little weird, like, uh, kind of archaic um, little, like, smirky smiles. And that becomes pretty standard from here on out, which is interesting. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, contrast and compare what our core uh, look like in relation to our uh, male statues. Okay, so this is uh, called the peplos core. Uh, peplos is a simple belted garment. So that's the name of the thing that she is wearing. So that's why that's part of her title. Um, and a peplos is a simple long wool, uh, woolen belted garment. This uh, individual, they think, is, is actually meant to portray a, a goddess. She's missing her hand, which would have been holding an attribute, which would have told us which goddess she is. It would have identified her. Um, she's actually wearing um, four garments in the style that's only used for goddesses. So that's how we know she's a goddess. Let's contrast this with the um, uh, Chrysos statue. So this statue is from uh, Enav Ersos, Greece, which is pretty near to Athens. This is a young man whose name was Kroisos, so that's why he's called Kroisos. That's actually the young man's name. And he apparently died a hero's death in battle. And the statue is meant to commemorate his death. So even though this looks quite similar to this previous statue, very much in the same style, um, this is of a specific person, okay, but it's not uh, portraying that person uh, from life, so it's, it's still kind of stylized in the style of the archaic time period. Um, it is a little bit more naturalized. If you look at it, it's, the muscles are a little bit softer, a little bit leaner. He looks a little bit more like an, a natural human person instead of a really stiff statue. Uh, the face still has the little weird archaic smile that they all have and it's, it's still pretty stylized. What's interesting about this one is we have an engraving that tells us more information. So on it, in Greek, it says, stay and mourn at the tomb of dead Kroisos, whom raging Ares destroyed one day as he fought in the foremost ranks. Okay, couple of things here. First of all, the statue is smiling, even though it's about a young man who was killed in battle. Seems weird to me, but that's a stylized thing, the archaic smile. Uh, second, do we notice anything about this inscription? It's calling out a god, Ares, the god of war, as being raging and as uh, carelessly destroying a young man. So what we've seen in previous cultures, they don't generally call out their gods. They're generally very like respectful and worshipful and doing all the things so that they can hopefully go on to that good afterlife. So this is a big cultural difference. The Greeks attribute these human kinds of emotions, like rage, like jealousy, uh, to the gods and goddesses and use that to explain why some things happen. Why did this young man die? Well, because Ares was raging out of control and wasn't paying attention to the consequences. So it's this very interesting thing that we have with the ancient Greeks where they attribute these human emotions to their gods and then blame them for these things. So they, they'll confront them. This is a pretty like confronting kind of statue. Like you should mourn this young man who was killed by Ares because Ares had a temper tantrum essentially. I mean, that's a very different kind of approach to the gods than anything we've seen so far. Okay, let's look at another one. This is a uh, Kore. She is in an Ionian dress. So this is a particular style of clothing. Um, it's an Ionian uh, chitin, is, is technically what it's called, which is like a tunic. It's made out of linen, so it's very, very light. She has a peplos under it, which is this long belted garment that the last person was wearing. And she has a hema, uh, hemation, which is a mantle uh, that kind of wraps around and is worn over it. It's a little heavier material. Um, so in this, we can see, one of the things I like about this particular statue is the uh, pigment used to paint it has um, stayed a little bit. It's changed color over time, it's oxidized heavily over time, but you can see remnants of how this would have been brightly painted. So when we think about sculpture from this time period, I think the first thing that comes to mind is all this like white marble. Well, most of these are made out of marble. 
um, and they are all one color, but that's not how they originally would have been. They would have been very, very brightly, kind of garishly painted, actually, in pretty bright colors, and just over time and erosion and exposure to the elements, the paint has worn away. But this one, we still have like a hint. We still have hints of the fact that there would have been um, color. That really dark blackish color would have been um, a very bright red, or the green would have been red, the black would have been uh, more of like a kind of orangey yellow gold color. So we would have had very bright coloring here. We can also see the archaic smile is there. We have the creepy little smile. We also still have the very stylized kind of hair. Uh, fairly stiff still, but she is kind of moving a little bit in a pose to the side, like she's kind of twisting her body a little bit. So we're seeing a little bit more of a naturalized pose. Okay, next we're gonna talk about ceramics again, but for now we'll stop talking about our archaic sculpture.